Thanks for the king. Hello, everyone. Uh, you joining the Hudson River Park and Advisory Council meeting, and uh, we are uh, going to begin our September 12th meeting. Uh, everybody had a wonderful summer, and. Before we do anything, I'd like you to just take a look at the attendance form that is actually in the agenda. And if you don't have it in front of you, I'm going to put it in here. If you could just fill out the attendance, uh, you'll see a link I just added. And then also I'm going to put an agenda again for those of you who are just joining us. And I'm pasting that in. And that has links to most everything that we are going to be discussing today. So why doesn't everybody take a minute and we'll wait for some stragglers and then fill out your attendance form and then we'll uh, begin in a moment. I haven't done that. It's in the near term. Yeah. All right. So, uh, in those in the agenda that I've sent, I've included April's minutes as well as June's minutes. And uh, do I have a motion to put a vote to the floor to approve the minutes? Uh, I can see Graham for the second. Isaac Daniel, um, uh, I would like to bring a vote to the floor uh, to approve the minutes rather than going for a roll call vote. Uh, does anyone have any revisions to the minutes? Seeing no revisions to the minutes, the April and June 2023 minutes are approved. Uh, so thank you, Jeffrey and Tammy, for getting those done. Actually, thank you, Daniel, for doing June's and Tammy for April's. So, uh, Moving on, um, you know, back in June, we spent most of our time talking uh, or actually listening to a presentation from the Battery Park uh, City uh, Resiliency, the authorities' resiliency plan. And a lot of work was spent by many folks on the AC. And in the agenda, you'll see a link to it. Um, this has been approved already by the executive committee. And other folks too have uh, taken a look at it and added in some comments and I've heard some from some others. Um, really the window for revisions on this has closed because I sent it again to everyone. And if anybody wanted revision, I wanted to put them in the comment section. So unless you have a really big point, I'll summarize the uh, resolution. Ultimately, we wanna create a task force to look more deeply into other alternative ways besides putting up a nine foot plus wall that ends at North Moore Street one that affects all the other community boards and everything north and isn't convincingly going to solve the issue. So uh, there's, it's a, written as a resolution um, and I would like to propose to vote on, the, on this resolution. And as soon as it's been distributed, let's just say uh, Tracy Jackson of Deborah Glick's office has looked at it. They've also sent out a similar letter. The trust has sent out a similar letter, not a resolution. And I think it's important that we join in official capacity so I can send it to uh, Robert tomorrow morning as a unanimous uh, resolution passed by the AC. Um, uh, rather than saying all those in favor, if anybody has any uh, questions or recusals, if you could raise your hand and then we can address those. Otherwise I will take a, a vote assuming unanimity. That's the right word. I see no hands raised. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna take that as all in favor. So the resolution passes unanimously. Excellent. Oh, there's a hand. Oh, there's a hand. Richard. Ah, Richard Horman. I didn't see your notes today on the uh, comments section, but how can I help you, Richard? Yes, sir. I, I'm gonna abstain on this. Of course, I understand. So let me make a note of that. Because um, I am a secretary tonight too. Uh, great. Um, so you're not recusing yourself. You are uh, abstaining. Correct. 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 
Uh, and next, we have uh, moving on to our park press report. We usually be uh, a little near the agenda, but today uh, we're going to be, I think, speaking with some uh, folks from the science leadership program, uh, getting a recap. And Robert, I'm going to give you the floor if you want to do any introductions can, about what the program is about. Can you send us by email the, the attendance form? Because it's not live in the, the thing. I can't. The agenda Follow that is link. live, but I will go ahead and you click the attendance form underline there. Yeah, it's on the line, but it, it it's not a live link in my document. Okay, here you go. That's the attendance form again. Just Thank you. And, but I mean, I'm I'm not on the chat. I, I can't get on the yeah. Zoom chat yeah. unless you want me to sign into the Zoom. We can we can email it. We'll email it afterwards. You know, Great. I will email it to you right now. Thanks. <laughs> you got it. Um. So um, as we're doing some of this, uh, I hope everyone had a great summer. Welcome. A little light attendance in person today. I hope we'll see more of you who are uh, remote uh, in person in the future. Um, and, but first, uh, before we dive into our trust report, uh, I first want to turn it over to uh, Michaela McCone, who uh, is... What's your name, please say? Science and Stewardship Coordinator. She's our Science and Stewardship Coordinator. Um, <laughs> she oversees uh, uh, one of her major tasks, and she only started us with us the past couple months, um, has been overseeing our science leadership program. Uh, and she'll I'll explain a little bit about you, but it's one of our re, uh, uh, one of the educational efforts that we are most proud of. <laughs> we pair high school students with uh, college students, largely uh, CUNY mentors, um, to uh, really get folks invested and engaged in the process of doing real science, um, including folks who have uh, gone on, frankly, had careers in uh, environmental science and uh, um, environmental education. So I'm going to turn it over to Michaela. We'll tell you a little bit about do the whole uh, thing on the both the program, uh, what it is, uh, some of our pieces, and then we're going to hear from some of our mentors who participate in the program on some of the results. Yes, thank you so much for having me. It's nice to see you guys. Um, so I will be talking today about the student uh, student leadership program. It's also called SLP, um, and this is an image of all of the SLP interns as well as our mentors. We have three mentors who are here today with us. Um, and we're missing the clue, so let's get into it. So um, what is SLP? The Science Leadership Program is a paid summer research opportunity for high school age female identifying students from underrepresented communities in STEM in New York City. Um, and this program is the collaboration of STEM institutions in New York City, Hudson River Parks River Project, City College, Young Women's Leadership School, Pinkerton Foundation, the Intrepid, and Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. In 2023, SLP had 12 interns and three undergraduate mentors. <laughs> uh, eight of these interns came from TWILS, which is the Young Women's Leadership School, and four came from Intrepid Schools for Girls program. Um, all three undergraduate mentors are currently City College students, and uh, SLP this year had three returning SLP interns from the 2022 cohort. So we had three students that had done this internship last year that came back to help us again this year. And we had um, this kind of one to four mentor to intern ratio with one returning intern and one to two in the group um, and one mentor per four interns, um, which allowed for um, this kind of in-depth feedback and guidance throughout. Okay. <laughs> um, so the goals of SLP are to gain experience and confidence in STEM through authentic research, professional development workshops, and near-peer mentorship. Um, and we also want the interns to complete the summer program with a stronger scientific identity, a better understanding of STEM careers and opportunities, and greater exposure to scientific methods and techniques. So our program schedule, we had Mondays and Tuesdays remote on Zoom and Wednesdays and Thursdays in person. Um, and interns attended workshops led by Hudson River Park Trust staff and consortium partners from the uh, New York City Research Mentoring Consortium. So we had people that from different projects um, within the consortium also give workshops. Um, and then students also research their full bolus research projects, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. And Wednesdays and Thursdays were in person. So they had that hands-on research experience as well. Um, within Hudson River, they had field trips and they had um, multiple opportunities to practice presentation and public speaking practice, as well as peer chats. And some of these workshops that they attended, not only in like on Zoom, but also on their field trips, included workshops such as 
literature review, how to read a scientific paper, how to River Park research, data illustration, data analysis, intro to Excel and Google Sheets, college preparedness, um, how to create a scientific poster and resonate building skills and interview skills. Um, and interns participated in these workshops to expand their leadership, communication, and scientific skills. And uh, these workshops were also a space to meet a range of STEM professionals and develop and practice professional STEM skills that could directly translate into their research projects, their academics, and even help them possibly in the future with their careers. Uh, so some of these hands-on research that they did in Chester River Park included our fish ecology projects, habitat, habitat mop and water quality analysis, um, environmental DNA analysis, fish dissections, microscopy, um, and also just learning about plastic pollution in our New York City waterways. Um, and some of our field trips included Little Islands and uh, the Intrepid, as well as the Natural History Museum. Um, so they got a lot of hands-on experience being in person, but also a lot of, you know, those professional and um, STEM skills on Zoom. Um, and just talking a little bit more about this whole full list project that they've done, um, SLB interns performed a program-long research project on goals and plastic pollution. Um, when I say goals, I mean seagulls out in the park. Um, this project taught interns about the impact of the environment uh, and plastic pollution and how it affects organisms that share the environment with our students. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay. um, at the beginning of SLP, interns were given four boluses that Hudson River Park staff had collected previously in the winter months. Um, a gold bolus is basically indigestible material that gulls can, it's basically indigestible material. So plastic, bones, shells, things that they ingest that they just can't digest. Um, so interns were able to digest all these boluses throughout, throughout the program. Um, and then they were able to identify if the materials were inorganic or if they were organic. So organic would be something like rocks, seaweed, shells, things that are naturally occurring in the environment. Uh, inorganic would be, you know, plastic pieces, foam, lime, those types of materials. Uh, and then they would be able to further identify it based on color, based on size, um, and based on location that it was received in the park. Um, so findings from this was then recorded into their data sheets and then combined data, they were able to fully analyze um, the plastic pieces, the color of the pieces, and the size of the pieces. Um, and then the kind of manifestation of this research project was a it was um, each twelve each of the twelve students created a scientific poster to then present at a consortium research symposium at the American Natural History Museum. So a scientific poster, for those who don't know, is basically a hybrid between text, graphics, and an oral presentation. A scientific poster is composed of an abstract, a background, um, a result section, and a conclusion and discussion section. So scientists and academics utilize scientific posters to discuss and present their research projects. So these are some of our students. Um, as you can see, they put a lot of hard work and effort into this. These are graphs that they created. They kind of use these workshops that they've been learning throughout the program to then utilize it and create the scientific poster, which they then presented at AMH. And these are our students at AM and H presenting their posters. Um, the symposium had an attendance of over 900 individuals with a total of 480 students attending. Um, and this symposium gave our SLP interns the opportunity to present their scientific posters and the opportunity to discover other programs. So they were able to not only present, but also walk around, network, um, use their new like communication skills and learn about other students' projects as well. Um, do you want to like close the model? Yeah. Um, so we did have evaluation tools for this program. Um, we had students participate in a pre-survey and a post-survey, and we collaborated with Lamont uh, Doherty Earth Observatory and the consortium that we're a part of to devise a well-rounded in-depth pre and post-survey. Um, the pre and post survey measured participants is interest and attitudes in pursuing STEM in the future and academic professional settings. 
He evaluated intern's confidence in their scientific skills, including the utilization of lab equipment, conducting research, presenting scientific topics to different audiences, and it evaluated intern's um, development of a STEM identity and growth in confidence over the course of a six-week program. So the pre-survey uh, pre was conducted on the first day of the program, and after six weeks, the post-survey was conducted on the last day of their uh, program. So mentors, we will have them come up and they will share some of the survey results with you and a little bit more about their, um, their collaboration and um, what they did during this six week program. Any questions? This is us again. This is the last day, a lot of smiling. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Do we go up there? Why could I just here. switch over here? Why do you think over here? Here? Yep. Okay, perfect. It's just one slide. Yeah, the, the camera. Oh, okay. um, um, where's the other? It's right underneath. So you're going to stop sharing. Yes. I have a question. So, in a city of eight million people, um, how does this scale? Because you know we can do these programs, but they're fairly expensive on a per child basis. Mm -hmm. So, how do we? No, we've got a serious problem with with. Well, two million kids in a city from over a million. How do we scale this problem, this solution? Because this isn't scalable as I see it. The issue of you know educating and giving hands-on experience. Yeah, I mean, in, in a large city, giving high quality educational experiences to a very small minority yes. is is not a solution. Mm -hmm. Um so I, I just want, I'll just step in here. I think you know, I oh, you know, I think the question is, you know, a, a little unfair as terms no, of the no. Park is uh, we, you know, we are really proud of our educational efforts. We have engage over 30,000 people kind of every year as part of our educational team. Uh, we do field trips with over 6,000 students. Um, and there are certainly global problems like education quality in New York City and quality of New York City education that are not going to be solved by Hudson River Park Trust. Right. So um, I, I just want us to like keep that in mind as part of it. So we have we have worked on scaling this program up. Um, it has expanded. We actually added an additional mentor this year. Um, we have sought uh, and we have gotten some grant funding to help do that. Are we going to replicate or be able to redo the entire New York City education system or take its place? No. Is that our place from a policy perspective? Also no. However, we are incredibly proud of the work that both our team does as well as our educators and mentors. We also... Um added four more interns this year. But just to respond to that, mm -hmm. it's wonderful all the people you address, but this is a very small number of people and it's not a scalable program. That's what I was bringing up. Right. Uh, Nothing. Thank, thank you for that feedback. Uh, we have a question from Tom. Tom, do you want to unmute? Hi. Um, it, I think it's great that you're doing environmental education, uh, education like this in depth with children. I noticed the demographic of the group. Are we looking to include citywide representation? How is this demographic selected and how representative are they of either the local population or the city's population? And is that an, uh, a, a goal at all of the program? Yes, so currently we recruit our interns from two separate institutions. One is the Goals for Girls program at the Intrepid, and the other is the Young Women's Leadership School. Um, these are primarily Title I institutions or programs, so it is primarily serving underrepresented in communities in STEM. Um, so that's kind of the demographic that we're looking for is interns that you know are underrepresented in the field itself um, and we're giving them an opportunity to get this really hands-on in-depth research. We're not looking to convert them into little tiny scientists. Um, we just want them to build these skills to not only help them achieve a goal of scientific identity if that's what they want, but to just establish confidence in their ability to you know present publicly on their information or you know, raise their hand, you know, make a safe space for them that they're able to ask questions and to delve deeper and to ask more. Um, so we are focusing on those two institutions right now. For recruitment next year, I think we're going to try to recruit from a third, which would be someone possibly in the realm of near the park or 
just in the park as well. So we're going to keep an open mind when we create the program for 2024 of who else we can, you know, recruit from. There's no, uh, there's nothing wrong with creating the seed to grow little scientists. It's a good <laughs> idea. But I think the distribution of involvement could be broader if the resource is allowed. And I think it's a great start. Great. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for the feedback. We, uh, yeah, we have expanded just within the past year and, you know, it's, it's primarily me running this program. Right. Yeah. So I am. Like passion. Yes. And we have, uh, we have three undergraduate mentors, which as Robert mentioned is another from last year as well. So we are expanding slower rate. I mean, uh, it's a lot to take on, a lot to develop this curriculum, to develop the schedule, to develop these relationships with our partner groups, and then to carry it out for six weeks and then do additional reporting after. Oh, so, fingers crossed that this program can not only improve, but also expand. Richard, do you have a question before we um, have our mentors present on some of our pre and post work? Yes, just a quick one. Um... I also think the program is great. It's it's important thing to do, and it's certainly in the tradition of, uh, and it's certainly a spirit of the River Project. Um, but I, I I would question. Um, I would also say that uh, young boys who are uh, underrepresented uh, are also underrepresented schools and underrepresented groups are underrepresented in STEM, and I'm wondering if you're considering expanding this program to include boys and girls? Um, so uh, part of the original, uh, the way the program started was um, in concert uh, with the Goals for, Girl program, Goals for Girls program at the Intrepid, um, which was one of sort of our originating partners. So we've sort of kept that, that going forward for now, um, but it's certainly something we, we would, will con consider in the future is to, to mix that up. Um, but, you know, we have been sort of proud about the uh, the expanding the range of folks who are able to really engage uh, in depth with our science. Um, you know, it is, uh, as Graham uh, highlighted, a very small uh, number of folks, but it is, uh, we hope, sort of some of the drops that help uh, to get the, the river flowing uh, so that more folks can engage. We do know, uh, and they'll talk a little bit about here, um, that some of our folks uh, who came through the program uh, have certainly like have expanded their interest in it um, and uh, in doing so have to get new ones. So we've had folks who moved up through the programs to become mentors, who then are also then working with the next generation uh, behind them. And so uh, that's sort of creating that upward ladder of folks into uh, the environmental science world um, both on the education side, but also on the science, uh, hard science side, um, is something that we are, we, we, we really appreciate about the program. Okay. I'm going to turn okay. it over. Thanks, Robert. Thanks. Oh, yeah, I'm over there. The camera's on, on you for that. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. All right, so okay. let's begin then. Uh, this presentation is mainly going to go over the methods that we utilized as we um, went through the SLP program as well as the pre and post survey results. Um, so I was one of the three undergraduate mentors. Among those was Emmanuel Hernandez and Luis Arides. Um, we worked together this summer to really provide a comfortable space for the interns to really learn, grow, make mistakes, and just grow in their scientific identity. That was a goal for all right, on my turn. So um, this to go over, we're gonna call it, uh, it's called the Science um, Leadership Program, but we also are gonna progress SLP. So if you see here any of those terms, um, it's, we use it interchangeable, uh, just cause SLP is shorter and it's like easier to say. <laughs> but SLP is an intensive um, six week program for female identifying high school students directed by the Hudson River um, Trust in correlation with City College of New York, as well as um, the Young Women's Leadership um, School of New York City, oh. the interpret Air, space, and um, sea, air, and space museum, and then this program helps to remedy the lack of quality mentorship and the underrepresented groups in STEM field. In this case, it will be the um, minority female students, and we aim to do this by working into like the we approach it by the tier mentorship approach, and this means like for us it was Michaela was our program coordinator, and she would give feedback to the undergraduate mentors, which is us, and then we were supervised the uh, twelve interns. And this, and then you would like act like we found out like we will like 
quantify the data, like because we took a survey before the program started and a survey after the program, and it was a pre we call it a pre survey and a post survey. And the pre survey is like uh, it will be questions about like the scientific identity, and uh, uh, the post survey would and mostly like <laughs> target the same questions, and we would just like. That's how you like quantify the scientific uh, confidence in the young students. So we were like, uh, before like we started, we did like a lot of research and the research were like uh, both past pre and post surveys as well as um, other research um, other research studies done. And we found out like that like SLP is really good and being able to like uh, <laughs> increase the scientific identity of, of the, uh, these young students as well as like, um, hmm, as, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, also, like we noticed that there's a, a low retention rate in the, in on the community in the STEM fields, particularly, and we we plan to fix this by um, giving the by helping them like become confident in the scientific identity. And we do this well. The program is funded, as stated before. It's funded uh, so both the interns and the mentors get paid, as well as the second years interns. Get paid, get far higher funding um, yield, and lastly, uh, we notice that there's a um, high confidence. Um, we are able to improve the confidence, their confidence in the sciences in the U, as well as um, improve their academic performance. And you can see Figure One; it's our picture of like all the uh, all the intern, all the mentors, as well as the staff. Figure Two, which is a second picture, is like them doing water quality testing at Pier Forty. And then figure three, which is like three pictures of them doing the bulletin section at Pier 40. And moving on to the posters, um, our beautiful graph there. <laughs> so the blue one is um, the pre-survey, as you can see, it's really low. And then the red one is our um, post-survey, which shows like, you can like clearly see the difference in um, like before the program, after the program. And now I'll pass it on to Greg. Yeah, so the methods of mentorship that we utilized in SLP um, are methods that have been utilized in previous programs that were intended to get women engaged in STEM and different underrepresented minorities engaged into STEM. Uh, underrepresented groups would be, you know, Latinos, uh, women in STEM, people of those uh, underprivileged communities, underserved communities that wouldn't otherwise have access to a program like this. Uh, the goal of these mentorship models were to get them engaged in this program. So there are two main mentorship models that we utilize at SLP. There's near peer mentorship, which mainly means that the mentors, uh, me, Emmanuel, and Lou, we are very close in identity to the interns. Um, you know, we're undergraduate students as opposed to Michaela, who's been out of high school for like, <laughs> I would say six years, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, eight years out of high school, we're like three and two years out of high school. We can relate to them on a like closer level. And outside of that age gap too, um, there's also our identities in terms of gender. Um, something that I've noticed when I interact with our interns is there's certain problems that uh, our female identity identifying interns may not be comfortable disclosing to another male mentor, but they will be comfortable disclosing it to a female mentor. So having that close identity makes them comfortable to disclose the problems that they're having. And thus, like, we can provide guidance for them as they work through that, through those problems and ultimately grow and improve in terms of confidence. Uh, and another component of that near peer mentorship is our second year returning uh, interns who did the program before and came back as a source of guidance for their fellow interns. Uh, and that also factors into our tiered mentorship model. Uh, tiered mentorship basically means that it's kind of like a hierarchy of mentors. So at top, we have Michaela, our coordinator. Um, there's the three undergraduate mentors and the huge batch of 12 uh, female identifying high school students. And within those uh, high school students, there are the second years who add another tier to that hierarchy. And having like, you know, uh, basically Michaela was guiding us 
as we guided the interns and the interns, the second years would also guide the bigger group of interns. So it's just pyramid basically. <laughs> uh, so I would say those methods were very successful and I will uh, now be okay. referring to our results to elaborate on that success. Excuse me while I pull out my phone to, it's hard to see oh, the, the exact statistics. Um, <laughs> so uh, throughout the course of SLP, according to the pre and post survey, the interns really got a sense of what science is like, like engaging in a STEM field, doing scientific research and actually becoming established scientists uh, through their symposium. And in the course of this, they built so many skills. Uh, at the start of SLP, 25% of our interns said that they were competent in presenting their research to other scientists, something that they would have to do at the end of the program. And by the end of SLP, 75% of them or confident in presenting to other scientists. That's a 50% increase, which I saw personally, like when I was at the poster symposium, I saw one of my interns actually pre uh, presenting to one of my professors and actually having a really good conversation about our research. Um, another skill that they learned was sharing the research with the community. Um, Hudson River Parks, one of the biggest, uh, I would say principles is, uh, community science. So that's a very important skill for our interns to learn. So at the start of SLP, 33% of our interns were confident in sharing the research with the community. But at the end of SLP, 75% of our interns were comfortable with it. So big increase on that point. Um, we also asked if they were comfortable uh, conducting a scientific research project at the start. 42% um, said they, they were comfortable doing that. And at the end of the program, 83% said they were comfortable. So 41% increase on that point in terms of learning that skill. Analyzing scientific data, a big part of any scientific research project is that, um, I forget, I can definitely attest to, 50% uh, of our interns said they, they were comfortable doing that, confident doing that. And at the end, we saw a 33% increase with 83% of our interns leaving the program confident in analyzing scientific data. Uh, a similar statistic can be seen with using scientific instruments, uh, presenting research to their peers, especially with presenting research to their peers. I saw big growth over the course of the program in terms of that. Um, we started off with 50% of our interns being comfortable doing that and ended off with 92% of our interns being confident in presenting their research to their peers. Um, asking research questions and formulating uh, hypotheses, um, big part of scientific research. 58% uh, of our interns were confident in uh, formulating hypotheses at the start of SLP, and at the end, 92% were confident. So we, are, we saw like huge improvement across the board in terms of confidence in, in scientific skills. Um, and this leads into one of like the two points that are my favorite. Um, we asked the interns, um, how likely are you to pursue a career in STEM? At the start, 50% of our interns were like interested in looking for a STEM career. And at the end, over 83% were really looking into a STEM career. Like I had interns that were shaky on in, uh, being in STEM. Some of them were even like, I don't know why I'm doing this program. I want to be in liberal arts. But that same intern like grew such a passion over the course of SLP, made me very happy. Uh, we also asked our interns, do they see themselves as a scientist? And to that point, 58% of them saw, saw them as a science, themselves as a scientist and 75% at the end saw themselves as a scientist. So, you know, bit of an improvement there. So looking at these statistics, we can say that SLP was successful in exposing our interns to the scientific skills. They got an understanding of what a career in STEM would look like, especially on the research side of things. Exposure to different uh, STEM skills, and that all accumulated into them overall 
having a high in interest in STEM, which is the basis of what we're trying to do as SLP, the Science Leadership Program. So overall, the program was a good success. I'm really happy with it. Michaela's really happy with it too. And I would like to, you know, thank all of you for letting yeah. me talk about this program. I really love it. Um, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Right. Thank you guys for that. Um, we had hoped to have some of our interns join also, um, but tonight is a high school school night. So <laughs> you guys are come on down. We're going to keep moving with the program. And, uh, Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you for having us, of course. Yeah, I was going to launch right in. <laughs> okay, great. I'm going to try to keep us moving. I um, appreciate you guys all listening to this. Um, uh, uh, our science and education efforts are, are you know, uh, core of what we do with the trust. Um, we appreciate the folks taking the time. Uh, uh, our students coming to the time. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Um, so with that, um, first up, if folks, I'm gonna, I will whip through uh, a bunch of our uh, 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 trust report. Um, it was emailed out to the advisory council. It's on the website now. Um, so uh, if folks do have questions, you should feel free to stop me. Um, I will pause. And I think on some things that I expect to get some questions on. Um, so uh, first up, I want to make sure folks, uh, everyone saw um, that we have our Submerged Marine Science Festival. Um, this is our uh, science education festival uh, at the end of the month. Um, it's a little earlier this year um, due to some scheduling conflicts, um, but we will be at Pier 84. Last year, we had over 5,000 people come through. Um, the, uh, much like last year, it is a two-day event. Uh, the first day on Friday is reserved for uh, school groups. Who are taking field trips to it. Um, and some of the advisory councils I know, uh, thank you CB1, CB2, uh, Tough Member Botcher, um, and some others have circulated it to uh, local schools to help do it. Uh, we do have a good local representation from the west side. We, it is also though a five borough event. We do actually pull Title one schools from all, from all over the city. Um, uh, I hope if you guys want to spread the word, let us know. If you have a school group that's interested in possibly attending, let us know. I think we have some, still have some slots uh, for field trips um, but uh, otherwise, uh, if not, you should join us on uh, uh, Saturday uh, the 30th, um, which is also Westside Fest, uh, which is a consortium of um, uh, cultural institutions here on the west side of Manhattan. Uh, it's Hudson River Park, it's the Whitney, it's Highline, it's Poster House, it's the Shed, um, and a whole bunch of others who are sort of joining together to celebrate uh, some of the great uh, efforts and investment here on the west side and our, our great literal cultural network. It's put on by the West Side Cultural Network, which is a group of us that work together to collaborate. Um, so join us uh, both for that um, and then head your way up to Pier 84 um, or start there and head your way down to West Side Fest um uh, on saturday to experience it i personally love the ec which brings the eels and you can see the eel ladder um you also can touch some fish you can do some things until the team bought an inflatable shark arch um which you shall come take your photo well i certainly will be um to keep it moving um and let's start questions um on design and construction uh we have uh things are moving well we are getting buster construction right now um, so uh, the science play area, um, if folks haven't gone by, our science play area with our larger than light sturgeon, uh, atomically correct, um, have been installed. You can see them. Uh, they're continuing to work on some of the site work for it uh, around the area. We expect that to open later this fall. Um, as an update on the estuarium immediately adjacent, um, uh, we have been working with uh, the design team on uh, some of the building concepts and how it fits in the tiny little postage stamp of a site um, and that sort of work, um, as well as some other uh, larger issues like how do you get water to and from the Hudson for our flow through system? What is it? Uh, what are the what are kind of requirements does that need to do? What are the flood plains? Um, and those sorts of questions. Um, we are looking to come back to uh, to do another round of uh, community engagement and participate in these discussions um, this fall. Um, I I don't know exactly when, in part because we haven't had conversations with CB1 uh, about scheduling it yet. So uh, we will let you all know. <laughs> we will let you all know when that gets scheduled uh, and how you can participate. Um, Five fifty uh, Washington Crosswalk is fully operational since our last meeting. If you would like to cross south of there, you now can. Um, you, what is it? Uh, the 550 Washington Crosswalk, the, the new crosswalk just north of the tennis courts, just south of Pier 40. Really like, you can't miss it as a flash of yellow light. 
It, it does have a crossing light. <laughs> um, it is, uh, we see some good uh, uh, crossings actually from it, uh, which I, I was a little surprised about the numbers. So, yeah, talk to me a little bit about the numbers. Um, we have no idea. I can only tell you what I see. Well, I, I see there are more people than I would have expected. I didn't expect it to do it. I think in part because of the construction um, around uh, the, uh, the St. John's terminal site on the north, um, more people are on the south side of the street already uh, and have been here to catch. Kind of and the uh, the catch for pedestrians waiting for the light. Is there enough space? It seems thing? to be working, my, yeah. much like the one at Clarkson uh, has worked. Um, uh, so that's, that's kind of what I got. Um, Gainsborough Peninsula, if folks haven't uh, gone up to the Whitney, um, is moving along. Um, I don't have a specific date. We are in that really horrible period for me personally, in which um, day by day weather impacts what potential date we would have. Um, last week of rain slowed things down by a couple of days, so I've had to move some things. Um, as soon as I have a hard date, which I can invite you all, we will get it out to you. Um, expect it relatively soon. Oop. Don't go past that. Can you elaborate how we're doing on the Pokemon chair? Uh, it is, it's constructed. It's called, it's cemented. You're done. Okay. Can you elaborate on the rules that the park will implement for using the boat launch? So we, we haven't seen any. Uh, you, you, we sat in that with um, sat with the water safety group folks um, as part of this, um, and we certainly can do it again. Um, I don't want to like do it off the cuff here, but I'm happy. But, to but we just haven't seen the result of that meeting. We haven't seen the park publish access yeah, rules. We've seen we haven't seen tentative drafted. We've not. I didn't need to. About a high level. Level. Anybody can use it. I think we right. Yeah. There's uh. So it's a walk up, um, walk up or water up, um, boat up, uh, boat ramp. Um, uh, there is not storage on site, so folks will have to uh, either have uh, you know, get in the water and go, or have a, a friend or someone uh, watch their boat um, as part of it. Um. It is otherwise first come, first serve. Um, I'm not sure exactly what other rules you're talking about. Well, you Would it have the same it? rules as NYC Parks? What? Would it have the same rules as NYC Parks? Um, I believe our rules are substantially set but I don't want to talk well, that's the question. Any, any the specifics? So, so there are. It is in Hudson River Park, so it's otherwise governed by Hudson River Park rules. Yeah, but it's opening in a month or so, right? So yeah. why don't we put it on the agenda? We'll go over the rules at the uh, next slide. Sound good? Sure. sure. Um. So um. Other than that, uh, Chelsea Waterside uh, ribbon cutting took place since our last meeting. If folks haven't been up there, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, it really is. Uh, uh, long awaited uh, building. I will be honest, when they first showed me the photos of it, um, I thought the building was rendering. It, it was not. It was an actual photo. Um, it looks great. Um, I'm also proud to say, or happy to say, um, that since the ribbon cutting and between then and now, um, Monstrum, which is on site in part to do the science play area, uh, was able to do uh, some of the repair work. A uh, long way to repair work on the large slide. Um, we had a, a, a really severe vandalism incident earlier in this year, uh, and it required some of their, their specialty carpenters to come and actually do some of the repair work for it. Um, so uh, we it is open, um, and I'm told enjoy it. It's open for Labor Day weekend. Um, Pier 97 is also coming along on Gangbusters. I'm told the all ages slide is in. I will make personally make all of you go down it. Um, the lawn on um, the sun lawn is in. I think they are I'm told they're working with some of the decking. Um, much like Gans Award, um, the building both here and at Gans Award will uh, likely they will open after the piers themselves open. The buildings are take take longer, uh, has DOB approvals, con ed, there's a whole other pieces, um, but we want to open the public spaces to uh, to the public as soon as we can. Um, so as soon as those mm -hmm. are approved, but the, the buildings will both come later. Um, and that includes the uh, concessions and bathrooms in both. Um, pickleball courts, give me four interim pickleball courts are under construction. I'm told the paving is happening in the next couple of weeks. Um, striping. There are 84 pickleballs? Oh, 34. Okay, sorry. Uh, 34th Street. Um, so uh, it, with the fencing to follow, with striping and, and nets. Um, so we will let you guys know that we'll also open this fall. As I said, we have lots of it. Um, and on uh, the 29th Street through uh, 46th Street section of the park, um, where we have had the design RFP out on the street, proposals are due. We're currently working our way through the internal and technical review. 
um, with the hope of having a selection um, by the end of the year. So uh, which point we can come back to you guys to start the sort of community engagement process and uh, first step of that design, which is to talk to the community about it uh, and what that section is and everyone's hopes and goals and dreams um, will be uh, early next year. So you're starting on 29th Street, going north? We, so we, there, isn't, there isn't a design yet. So no, I'm just saying not a design, but so there is a section from 29th Street, which is from South of the Hill Port through Pier 84. Uh, that is one of the last unfinished Esplanade portions of the park. So they moved um, the heliport. What? You so say you're moving the heliport? Mm, I heard that too, Alan. <laughs> uh, so the, the these I know. So did I. <laughs> section without moving the heliport. So there, there is currently no change of the heliport as we've. Uh, mentioned before, there are uh, any number of existing infrastructure pieces within that section of the park. The ferry terminal is not going anywhere. Um, there are, so it is uh, going to be in part some challenges, and we'll we'll have to get some get into some discussions about sort of some of the long range vision and planning uh, as part of that process. I don't want, I don't want to get ahead of it. So. Nice try. For the, for the so future. you're not building the park there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have heard, certainly heard everyone's. Concerns about the health board. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, other than that, um, uh, in addition to, uh, I'm going to skip ahead through some of our programming stuff. Uh, folks, hopefully, had we had a great programming season. Uh, River Project programming, in particular, science education stuff, is still ongoing as part of our summer season. So, we hope to have some um, additional uh, number, we'll have some numbers for next uh, next month. Um, I will say we do have fall field trips in addition to submerge. So if folks are interested, we do. We are programming right now our full fall season uh, that runs through uh, I think kind of early December uh, for a field trip. So if you have schools who want to come uh, to either Discovery Tank or uh, to the wet lab for the next little bit or some of the other uh, in park field trips, uh, always give us a shout. Um, we do again waive fees for Title One schools. Um, the Tribeca monitoring. Um, we have now um, additional 5 million uh, oyster spat that we put in over the summer in the Tribeca section of the park as part of our habitat enhancement work. Uh, 5 million, additional 5 million. I believe we have 35 million total so far that we have installed throughout the park. Um, that includes both the Tribeca and the section just north of Gans of Work. Um, and it is, these are again on our uh, Gavion on reef balls. Um, this was our second year of monitoring. Um, and they are currently undergoing some technical pieces. We pulled up some pieces, they take photos, they do counts. Um, hopefully have some more of that information after we process the, the, the data as part of it. Um, the Tribeca monitoring, which is our five-year monitoring commitment, is one of the largest, again, largest research pieces on habitat enhancements in uh, this uh, lower portion of the estuary. Um, so we're, we're actually really proud of, of this long, long range commitment about uh, the, to, uh, the impacts and uh, efforts on habitat enhancements. Um, there, we, a lot of folks have done them. Um, we are really helping to do uh, some do some of the legwork on determining its effectiveness, um, as well as uh, we're hoping to try to get some learn some more about what uh, does and does not work in terms of it uh, and in terms of the enhancements. Um, I'm not going to talk about our Spartina grass. It's growing. Um, public programs was great. We had over uh, 15,000 people at Blues this year. If any of you came, I didn't. I don't think I saw anyone, but perhaps you were there. Um, it, which was, I think, one of our largest ones. We've ever, was our largest one Blues festival we've ever done. Um, we have had uh, sunsets also wrapped up. Uh, with I believe our height was 2,800 people came out to salsa. Uh, we averaged about 2,000 people per week on Pier 76. Um, we, uh, our bike classes uh, with Bike New York are ongoing for the, I think, another next month of Pier 76. Um, so we've had a really good pieces. We're, right now, the programs team is turning both uh, significantly to um, uh, both field scheduling, uh, which is actually more work than anyone would possibly imagine, uh, intense, uh, uh, trying to make the six sided Tetris work. Um, as well as our run walk seasons. We are a uh, hot spot for run walks in New York City, given our tasks. I'm sure none of you are surprised to hear that. Uh, so we have a lot of charities who come to do their do their events and do their run walks and fundraising here in the park as part of it. And it, it takes a lot of planning on our part uh, for both safety and then to try to make sure that we are uh, routing people and respecting our other existing uses um, without overwhelming any one section of the park. Um, uh, on the operation side, they would want me to tell you about Pride Sunday. We had about, uh, I think our estimate, Chris, was uh, 8,000 people this year. I think it was about that, yeah. Uh, 8,000 people this year. I think it was a little less uh, than last year because of the rain. Um, otherwise, uh, uh, 
other than one unfortunate uh, incident um, that where someone had to be removed from the park, uh, an otherwise very safe event. We're really proud about our ability to get that many people in, uh, have them celebrate uh, and out uh, without issue. Um, it is uh, an enormous effort for our staff. It is a full trust effort. Um, this year we had some of our uh, park ambassadors out there greeting people uh, in addition to our, uh, to our operations and enforcement folks. Um, air quality was a big issue for us this summer. Um, I'm sure folks were aware. Um, you may not have thought about the impacts and that needs on outdoor uh, organizations like ours who have our horticulture staff, our PEP staff out. Um, it was during our hands fast, which we lost one of our days for some of it, um, but we had to come up with some, but a whole bunch of new policies for it. Um, New York State DOT bikeway resurfacing project is complete. Um, and, and, and except for, I'm told, some editing work. Um, you will also see, um, you may have gone just south of here at Gansport, you may have seen the barricades move back and forth as part of our construction. We are now to that edge, um, but uh, I believe it is uh, almost entirely done. Uh, and then when the park reopens, it will re-stripe it so the pedestrians can be routed onto the interior, what will now be the new interior esplanade for it, um, instead of being alongside uh, the bikeway. Can I share a Gansport Peninsula adjacent update? Go for it. Was that going to be in your? This is, this is all yours. Go for it. So um, I'm putting my work hat on for a moment. Hi, everybody. By the way, Jeffrey LeFrance, I joined late. Um, and it's nice to see everybody that's here. Um, Gansborough Plinus is coming online, but so is a new crossing of the West Side Highway directly off of Gansborough Street to connect the Whitney Museum, the lower, the, you know, the northern part of the West Village and all the meatpacking with Gansevoort Peninsula. Um, as a part of that crossing and, and the significant work we did to get the state to install that crossing, um, the park went out of its way to make sure that they could greet, frankly, is, is sort of what it's referred to as receive the landing. Um, and on the other side of that, I'm proud to say that in the meatpacking bid, uh, we installed um, a new 7,000 square foot pedestrian plaza that we are calling Gansevoort Landing, so that as folks make their way either from Hudson River Park into meatpacking, they're going to have a place to land and orient themselves, or sort of vice versa. You get you leave the Whitney, you come from dinner, come from the village, you stop in this spot, and then make your way across the crossing uh, to get to Gansevoort Peninsula. So that has actually been installed the past week. Uh, and will be finalized the next couple of weeks. So all of these amazing things happening, not the crosswalk, that has not been installed yet. That is that is coming, um, we expect uh, this month as well. So excited to be sharing that all. Will that include wayfinding on one side or the other? Um, the We're figuring out what our wayfinding is in terms of what will be on the plaza on the bid side. Mm -hmm. um, I want to give just from our side a big shout out to um, uh, Jeffrey and the meatpacking cool. bid, which has really been uh, pushing it and coordinating a lot of the efforts with some of our other state partners. So. And, and I have to say, and Daniel, correct completely for CB2 to be like full throated support. CB2 personally of this. really just got out there with a shovel to begin the crosswalk. <laughs> um, okay. So um, with that, um, I actually want to turn it over to Chris McGann. Um, talk about some of the uh, safety uh, concerns and issues we've had over the summer. Um, as most of you have, uh, probably have heard by now, there was a uh, someone was murdered on Pier 84 on July 13th. A um, 35-year-old man went to sleep on a bench, and about 15 minutes later, a 20-year-old uh, male stabbed him and fled the scene. Um, that happened on a Thursday. On Monday, NYPD arrested the suspect in Chicago. He's been extradited back. Um, yeah, that was uh, apparently the word was he had a fight with his girlfriend earlier in the night and was agitated and walked around saying he was going to do something like this. We provided the NYPD with significant video of the whole event, you know, I'm fleeing. They followed him. They got additional video. That's how they identified him. That's how they identified the people who were with him. Um, and that's they made an arrest on that very shortly thereafter. Um, more re recently, on August 21st, there was a bias motivated assault in front of uh, Pier 40. There was a female jogger coming southbound along the Esplanade at 8.30 in the morning. There was a male that passed her, um, made some uh, disparaging homophobic remarks towards her. Words were exchanged. It led to a, a more heated confrontation, at which time he assaulted her, punched her a couple of times. It ended 
It looks like the fight started again shortly thereafter. He fled north on the Esplanade. Again, we provided the NYPD hate crime unit with a significant video of it, everything we had. He apparently exited the park at Christopher Street. Our two cameras at Christopher Street weren't working at that time, but everything north of it was, so we know he didn't come north. Um, they were able to follow him along the way. I tried to get an update on this case yesterday and today to provide you. I was unable to. I apologize, I guess, with 9-11 and everything, everyone's busy. But I will get an update and provide it to you. Um, they're actively searching for the person. He's been highlighted on um, Crime Stoppers. There's a $3,500 reward. And like I said, it's currently with the NYPD hate crimes. Have they identified the person? Not that they've let me know about. Um, they've narrowed it down a lot. They have a good idea. And um, again, when I get an update on that, I'll let you know. Uh, again, other than that, the park has been, you know, we haven't had too many serious crimes. The last, we had a person murdered the last time that happened was July 5th of the previous year. And that was someone else that fell asleep on the bench. And it was another, this was an emotionally disturbed person back then that stabbed him and then went on for the next two weeks to stab other people as they slept. And he was, he's been arrested too, so. Um, so unless there are questions on those pieces, I will keep moving. I mean, high level at what point? Yes. So obviously we've had some of these incidents over the past. What is the first position on um, mitigating I mean, obviously more cameras, cameras on yes. the street, but what can we do to help you to support what you feel is your research in what might make the park even safer? So, you know, we, we do put a lot of energy and effort into uh, park safety. It's like with uh, a, a key facet for us, it, it, it is uh, sort of first, first and foremost above all else. Um, what we do know is that, unfortunately, the park is not immune from sort of larger trends in New York City or the larger issues. We are um, on like 150 acres of upland area um, or uh, land area of Square Manhattan. Um, and um, as, despite that, with, uh, as Rob Rodriguez would tell me, uh, 52 crosswalks, um, none of which can be closed, as well as low pieces all over, uh, low um, railings all over. So we unfortunately can't fully close the park. Um, we have uh, increased um, some more pet present, uh, uh, presence. Uh, we work on security cameras. Um, although, and despite all of that, um, we are, we do know, and I think maybe Chris can talk a little bit about this, that we are relatively, comparatively, uh, very safe um, uh, alongside uh, both compared to some of our uh, neighbors and in my precincts and others. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we continue to do our best to try to, to push for it. Um, I don't, you know, I think we can all acknowledge we're never going to get to zero um, without, frankly, radical changes in our society at large. Um, so um, it is something we, we do take very seriously on. Some of these, frankly, freak incidents are are just that. I don't know, Chris, do you have yeah, I was going to say, those are, right, outliers. But I, I think, it, you know, everyone in the city, there's a perception that, you know, crime is up and the city's more dangerous. And certainly the perception I have and as I look at the numbers, especially in the park, that's not accurate. And I go over them because, you know, I see that and I question it. Like, what is the difference? And then I looked at the four precincts surrounded us. And the same thing, crime is not up there either. Actually, crime is coming down in many of the precincts and it's come down in the park. I think a lot of what we see is maybe some of the quality of life issues that we see. Harassment, um, you know, homelessness, emotionally disturbed people that we encounter that don't always lead to crimes or criminal activity, but it gives you a perception. So that's not showing up in the numbers. Doesn't mean it doesn't make you feel uneasy, but as far as actual hard crimes, we're down. And the four precincts that border us are down also. I might actually have Mary uh, actually chirp in here because we talked at our executive committee meeting about some break-ins at Los yes. um, Mary, I don't know if you want to, uh, rather than me repeat what you said, to see you now. Well, Chris and I have been in pretty close touch about this because uh, um, we've had some very odd uh, instances at uh, Lilac, a couple of emotionally disturbed people um, coming in and demanding credentials from my crew and things like that. Um, we have had also um, 
a couple of break-ins, but they seem to be people just, you know, like kids at the end of the school year goofing around. Um, but as Chris said, it can make you feel uneasy. My crew's been very nervous. I've been spending a lot more time on site as an extra supervisor to make sure people feel comfortable and safe. Um, so it takes a lot of time away from other things, but a lot of it doesn't rise to the level of a crime either. Hey, Chris, did you get those cameras fixed that were down? Yes, yes, that, that was actually just two. And sometimes they have to be reset. Our network is a wireless network. It sends a microwave from satellite to satellite. Sometimes it gets interrupted by trees, weather, you know, vehicles, and has to be uh, adjusted. They come back quick. But all of them are operational for now. Yes, yes. And I saw um, Tracy. Did you have a question you put in the chat? Yeah, uh, I think Tracy is uh, speaking. Hi, I'm here. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, good. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm, I'm zooming. I don't even like to zoom, but here I am. Um, Yes, what did I just ask you? Oh, about e-bikes. I know everybody's favorite topic. Um, so I was wondering if the if the trust is engaged with any of the coalitions that are working on e-bike issues. A number of them have uh, formed recently and our offices have been meeting with them. I know all the other elected offices are as well. So that's the question is, is the trust doing any kind of engagement with those other groups um or should the advisory council safety committee engage with those groups is that helpful for brainstorming and advocating for legislation policy um that sort of thing and then the other thing deborah wanted me to just share is she heard Bo uh, boomer esiason um talking football i guess over the weekend about how unpleasant it was to ride his bike recently on the bikeway and he was apparently kind of going on a bit about how awful the speeding was of the e-bikes and was um you know raising concerns about that so she wanted me to share that as well i'm gonna give the floor to wendy who uh drafted uh, took some of our previous resolutions from the advisory council and cb2 and put together a really uh a great letter that uh we're going to probably send out tomorrow. Mary and I just have to review it. It's not something that we need a vote on, but Wendy, you did the work. Do you want to talk a little bit about the letter that uh, we're going to send out? Wendy, you there? Sorry. I was just texting with her about this topic. Yeah. Um, anyway, the... Uh, yeah. Oh, this is the commercial, the e cargo bikes? They're, yes. they're having a city council yes. hearing tomorrow? Yes, it's a public okay. session. We're going we're gonna, to uh, submit our point of view on it, but also remind um, the mayor that we need uh, an alternative path to these fast moving e bikes. And we've written resolutions about expanding 9A and uh, that it's not currently working, just like Boomer Science had mentioned. <laughs> right. And so without uh, Coming up with a plan, uh, even the, the other thing is, I think Wendy would talk about reclassification of the Greenway. Right now, it's administered by the state and it's dysfunctional because we don't actually have any kind of enforcement. It should really be looked at in a different way so that we can actually have people follow the rules. And there's, it's almost like disregarded uh, because I think everyone's going to assume that these cargo bikes can go in the Greenway, even though we all know that they're not because it's not a city park but there needs to be better clarification and maybe a reclassification. So maybe the state isn't the best vote. Oh, when are you back? Can you hear me? I wanted you to take the lead on this. If I you wanted to. Mind. I don't think she can hear me, but anyway, that's the gist of it. I put the letter in um, the chat. It's draft right now. It also gives you uh, a link to uh, the, the, the public session. I can read it for everybody very quickly. Um, uh, New York City Parks has launched a program to allow e-bikes and e-scooters to use city park drives and greenways for a one-year pilot program that began on June 20th, 2023. Pilot was first announced in March as part of Mayor Adams' char uh, Charge Safe, Ride Safe, New York City's Electric Micro Mobility Action Plan, which outlined, how, which outlined how the administration is working to keep New Yorkers safe as electric micro mobility use grows and how to support the rapid adoption of these devices. You can learn more about the program. 
The idea is that there's going to be a comment section tomorrow, tomorrow, September 13th. And um, if you continue to read, uh, it's really the same points that we've been making for a couple of years. I think Jeffrey introduced it like three years ago, right? <clears throat> COVID, all three CBs, CB1, 2, and 4, all have supported it. Um, but the idea is don't, you know, make sure, let, let's take a look at this Greenway, which is the busiest thoroughfare for bikes in the nation. Um, and let's address the, an issue that not only Boomer has, but anybody that cycles without a powered bike feels the same, same way. Wendy. Okay, thank you. That that's helpful, and thank you, Wendy. Um, I so I guess just my my original question was: do you, Would anyone find it helpful to be connected to any of those groups? I don't know. If it's like the um, Bossy, which is my favorite acronym, Bicycles Off Sidewalk Initiative, and the E Vehicle Safety Alliance. Is there any value in having somebody from the AEC participate in those groups. I mean, I know we hate to add more meetings to our calendars. Um, and I know the elected offices hear from them and talk with them, but that's my question. Should the, does anyone want the AC or the trust to be more connected to, to those groups? I think that the AC needs to be a little connected, but I also think that Albany, sorry, this is Tammy talking. Um, Albany needs to kind of take a look and let New York City local control for speed limits and automated enforcement. Because I think part of the problem that we're seeing it, if I'm wearing my advisory council trust hat on, right? Um, we have absolutely no determination of what happens on the greenway. The city is making decisions about what's gonna happen on the city streets and the sidewalks that connect to the Hudson River Park Trust. No one understands in New York that Hudson River Park is not a New York City park in itself, and it's even listed on the park site. So right now, if you're sitting on, I'll just use in my own hood, in Pier 26, you can see Rebel scooters on Pier 26. You can see people in e-bikes riding all over the park because they have no consideration and no understanding that it's actually not city land. It's state greenway. It's state park or how or different park we see this as it also then extends down into battery park city in part to parcel to the fact that new york city dot has the designated bike path as the greenway and the esplanade so there's no way for anybody to really understand it but if albany could give new york city control of speed limits automated enforcement you know, there are, you know, the space on 9A, we've all talked about that. And classifications, we need to really reclassify how DMV looks at anything that's a moped. That, I mean, it's, and, and find some way to get all of that back because, yeah, riding a moped upstate in Syracuse is extremely different than it is down here. And uh, we need some more, I, I'm afraid to say we need local control because I don't think we can control it locally. Um, but if we don't have that, then how are we going to be able to safeguard the park and the green light? Because as Robert is so fantastically to remind us at every meeting when we talk about the green light, <laughs> that is state DOT, which I get. Right. Right. Well, and the I think the key there is we've talked about many times over the years is the enforcement piece. So whether the city has local control over the speed limits or not, um, right now, current rules aren't being enforced. So I think that's the question. But automated enforcement is an interesting area to explore. So and I know Senator Hoyleman Siegel has some legislation. I think Assemblymember Simone has some legislation. Um, so, you know, we electeds are talking, our offices are talking to each other, but um, okay. I just, I just was thinking from the advocacy perspective, if anybody wants an introduction to any of those coalitions, let me know. Just to chime in on. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, I appreciate okay. you reminding okay. us that the, uh, the bikeway is part of Route 9A, part of the highway. It's not part of the park. Uh, we pick up right on the other side of that. Um, 
their eastern border is our, or their western border is our eastern border. Um, and I will also just add uh, as just a point of piece um, that the one difference between Hudson River Park and Battery Park City is that Battery Park City does allow bikes on its esplanade. So CHCOG's map that allows bikes on their esplanade is, is actually, um, they are allowed, it is not against Battery Park City rules. No, but the way that New York City DOT has it listed is that it's a bike path instead of lo uh, yeah. listing it as a shared roadway because there are yeah. parks on places in the Esplan that you must dismount and people don't. Tom. Hi. Um, I think we've um, really talked this thing to death. Uh, we all know what the problem is. With all due respect, Robert, we all know who owns what and who's responsible for what. It's just nothing's happening. Um, so I think that Tracy's idea is a good one. The strength in numbers. We are the primary people responsible for the Hudson River Park bicycle path. All of those other advocacy groups can add to our voice. I don't think there's any reason why we don't form a little advisory group, a little working group, or whatever we want to call it, and invite those people to join us because the strength in numbers, the elected officials would benefit from having additional voices. And some people actually get their butts out in the street and do things instead of talk. So being involved with people who are more energetic in terms of making their uh, desires and concerns known might be helpful. We can't do it, but others can. I, I agree. And Tracy, why don't you go ahead and send me the information? I think it's a good idea to not only invite them, but also participate with them. I did want to mention that I think that the, uh, there are going to be cargo bikes allowed on the sidewalks to park out yeah. buildings. And uh, so I don't, you know, that's going to be it's part of this legislation that the city council is going to be approving. I think it's unanimous. So there are a lot of issues that are just being ignored right now. So if you think that a cyclist is just going to try to find a space between cars that are parked and get onto a sidewalk, uh, that's not going to happen. You're going to see more cyclists on the sidewalk because they've been empowered by new legislation. So we do have to uh, we have to raise our voice. And I, I do think that I, you know there's a. Uh, there's a thing when you're in a condo, right? It, you're responsible for the things in your own four walls, but everything that happens on the wall between you and somebody else, you comment on, you know about, you don't control what happens over there, but you certainly have a voice to say something. I think that applies to the Greenway and the and the park because we, much like what Dan's saying, it's getting worse, it's not getting better. So if we're going to be the largest elephant on the west side, let's let's, let's start talking. We're with you, Tracy. So let us know how we can uh, get the megaphone. Okay. Okay. And then I have one more item just to wrap out my otherwise very long report. Otherwise deeply comprehensive. You're all very welcome. <laughs> um, uh, in August, um, uh, the trust uh, re released an RFP. Um, for the green uses at Pier 40. Um, these are the berths on the north and western side of Pier 40, uh, currently occupied by Hornblower. Um, Hornblower, in, uh, in part, um, as a, a result of a uh, antitrust uh, concern with the New York AG contracts cornucopia, um, which, uh, as you'll see, the cornucopia votes as well. Um, so it is uh, Reaffing a new lease, a uh, lease term is coming up. Um, so we are reauthorizing. We have a, a proposal, uh, a request for proposals out. Um, it is all things that are, are currently allowed uh, under it, um, and uh, we're hoping to get a robust, robust response. Um, I do just want to say um, just a couple pieces uh, for it. Um, so this definitely does not uh, impact on the south side of it. This has nothing to do with Warren Field or any of the uses on the south side. Um, and uh, importantly, uh, this uh, the hornblower in particular uh, currently generates about one point two million dollars a year in revenue. It's a substantial portion of the the, the money we make from Pier Forty, which again is a substantial portion of the money that we have writ large, um, and and funds all the other great things that we have talked about. Um, in, we uh, in, we attended Manhattan um, Community Verse Two's August meeting uh, just uh, to to connect with them. Um, we've had we had some issues uh, with noise uh, this summer um, that we worked very hard to resist and see 
seems to have uh, quieted back down again. Um, so, uh, and uh, we have definitely are looking for uh, reputable respondents whose operations are compatible uh, with both the residential character immediately inland, uh, as well as with the park uses. Um, and you know, nobody wants to be receiving, and including us, Chris, our real estate team. Uh, you know, one AM calls about noise. Um, we have concerns about obviously about traffic at Pier Forty, uh, which is always an ongoing uh, concern. So, um, we, we certainly will see what we get, and we'll keep you guys updated as we move through the RFP process. Yeah, you know, one of you know one of the issues is also crossing uh, in Roy Street. We have drunk people getting off the boats and making a lot of noise, and they can't really cross there because they're not allowed to. With the would you have, have you ever considered creating a crossing there to actually mitigate some of the pedestrian overflow? Leroy Street. Leroy Street. Because either they go to Morton or they, yep. they go to Morton or they cross there anyway. So they, definitely, you see them walking across because they don't know any better. That's the easiest way across. So uh, it's definitely something we can raise with our operations team and that we can keep in mind as we um, talk to them or have Yeah, because there. they're not less boats, but they're more boats and it's more people. So I think you know safety is important. No, it certainly is, and, and uh, that's a good flag and for Chris and others. We'll, we'll take it back to the We want to have a lot of cabs and Ubers like pulling over right there at the Leroy like King area. So I also feel that Thornblower, as it's growing, really should have safety officers out, officers out, especially late at night. Um, so Hornblower uh, currently does have um, some folks. Um, I certainly can hear. Um, I don't think it's a comment I've heard before, um, but certainly one will take back and doesn't need to wait for an RFP to, to respond. Um, but those are definitely the sort of operational issues that uh, we will uh, uh, keep in mind as we look for future concepts. It's only when people are getting off. It's no problem when they're getting off. Well, traffic when good folks are getting on is a little concern. <laughs> but they're not. You better know the pier turn around. <laughs> they're not crossing in the middle of West Street. Yes. They're, they're right. they haven't had a, you know the twenty drinks yet. Yes. So um, you know, it is, you know, we we are we are reputable operators, um, particularly marine users are, is something that it, we is top of mind. We we know we do know many of these concerns. Um it's certainly something that we uh, is front of mind. Like as I said. Um, reputable operators that respect the resident you know, character and the park uses around them um, is what I can say. Can I ask about um, when you're doing the RFP process, what the dialogue and conversation is about music on board boats, um, whether they're allowed to be blasting music when they're docked on the pier, and how, and I, I know the answer is no, but um, when does it start and when does it stop? Like, is there a within one mile of Pier 40? Like, I'm trying to understand what goes into the RFP that to understand the noise, whether or not within the RFP they're also not allowed to be within, well, let's say, 500 feet of the, of the seawall of the island. So, um, I'm actually going to segregate this because there is a, a, a formal process for questions specifically about the RFP, what would be allowed and not allowed under that. And I don't, I'm not going to uh, reach that. There is a, a way in which that's questions for it. Um, what I can say is separately and fully apart from the RFP um, is that uh, Hornblower's current agreement does have limits on um, noise as uh, as a distance from a pier. We only have the ability to control and can frankly in part is only enforceable within um, Hudson River Park waters itself. Um, so we are only able to go out to the pier head line within our boundaries. Um, you know, we, we do not have the ability to control um, businesses once they are fully outside of our area. Uh, and that is part of the you know moving concept. Um, it is certainly something noise overall is certainly something that um, is well made for this, and that we have certainly done enforcement on. Um, this summer we had noise issues about uh, horn blower um, playing mu music too loud, too close to the pier, um, and we're able to have been working with them on uh, both uh, setting uh, enforcing those limits. Um, we've had folks out there who actually been doing some proactive. Uh, pieces where we go out and listen for when the focus is coming out um, and try to do it or uh, taking off, um, as well as uh, additional uh, communication structures uh, so that um, both Hornblower and then as its as its subtenant Cornucopia, um, there are uh, communication protocols in place to be able to, to get word to folks when, when there is violation. So we were trying to work on that proactively. Comment then. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, several things. One is, uh, unfortunately, Tammy, the United States Coast Guard is responsible for everything within the navigable waterway. Uh, so everything outside the tips of the piers, which is a federal navigable waterway, 
is under the jurisdiction of uh, the United States Coast Guard. Um, and they haven't been as sensitive to noise complaints. However, uh, having had a, a club, Water Taxi Beach in Long Island City, that annoyed the people in Riverside Towers and Dan Garadnik's neighborhood on the east side, because sound bounces across the water, I know that people are responsive to direct approaches from elected officials who represent those areas to reduce noise. And lastly, I've heard that one of the problems the trust has had with enforcing noise uh, um, levels is that cornucopia is a subtenant of hornblower. So you got to talk to hornblower, to talk to cornucopia, to talk to the captain of the vessel, to will the new RFP have leases for each operator so that they're each under the jurisdiction of the Hudson River Park Trust and can't pass the buck with, well, you know, we're hornblower, but they're a subtenant. Uh, I think each of them should have their own leases and their own time slots. I've worked on the water a lot. It's, it can be done. Sorry. I just want to take that as a, as a comment. Um, I can't speculate on what proposals we will get or what OB structure would be. How is, how is the RFP written? And people have some tenants. That's simple. Uh, so the RFP is up on your website. If you want to go take a look, I'm not going to, sure. get, I'm not going to speculate again on this, on what, what area. You're not familiar with it. Okay. Understood. It's a good point. Uh, thank you. Any other I'll, re I'll read it and make comments. Um, just because I went to the walkthrough this morning, um, I made a couple of comments in the chat, but um, there there was a huge turnout, I would say, a lot of interested vessel operators. I didn't even know all of them. Um, I know uh, New York Waterway was there and, were in, and they were interested in looking at possibilities of running a water taxi out of there. Um, and I don't remember what it says about subtenants, Tom, but the RFP is written, I think, pretty broadly to consider all kinds of vessel operations, including educational and cultural ones, even though Pier 40 is a big funder for the park and needs to be operated commercially. So um, I, I think there's the possibility of a real variety of applications with different ideas for uses there. Eric, do you mind sending me putting your questions back in the chat again or emailing them so I can include them in the minutes. And it also makes sense, um, Robert, to consider putting a noise monitor on Pier 40 um, on the roof. Um, we've done it in local areas. It's not only when the noise happens, but the decibel level. Um, and you can sometimes use city regulations in terms of uh, DEP's noise level restrictions to enforce um, set noise pollution. It's an area that sound does carry. So if you're even north of the uh, path train uh, air shafts, uh, you can you can hear people talking. Is coming off the boat, so it's not it, it's not conducive to any kind of sound whatsoever. But I would love to have a a noise monitor in some you know some place over there. So we actually engage it. <laughs> well, just put one in your apartment, Dan, and open the windows. Right, right. <laughs> and every boat plays music to get the people on, and they yeah. play, they leave. So. It just should be no music, but they do it on every boat. They don't have to play it when they're leaving. They're trying to get rid of them. Because I know Jeffrey loves that. Up, up the You're right. When they're coming back into harbor, they're not. It's it's the people that are making the noise, not the music. <laughs> can, I, can I ask about the noise? Noise that's not related to Pier Forty if we're done with Pier Forty, but still on the boat. Question on Pier Forty: is, is the intent to increase? Essentially, the use, the type of use overall, once you get all these responses, or it depends on uh, on the type of response. We'd obviously love to get more money out of it, um, out of Pier Forty, and uh, increasing our revenue is always uh, an important piece. Um, but it, again, it will in our RFP is broad, um, as it was said before, um, and so I can't, and we I can't guess at what type of thing we will get at or the results of that. Will be. 
there's no limit to whatever. It's not like status quo as far as the overall use. It's going to be whatever you, you get back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a wide range. Yeah, yeah years ago, we had Norm Lower come to another advisor council. Uh, that was helpful. So maybe they yeah. asked, like, like, let's see if they're going to get yeah. yeah. extension of the RFP. Mm -hmm. Maybe at some point, uh, the sun, this summer's over, but maybe in the spring, we can invite them here <clears> and <throat> talk to us and we can voice our complaints. Because I certainly uh, can say that we'd be happy to try to bring whoever is the uh, selected respondent as part of the RFP here. <laughs> you're, you're <right>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kenny, so that brings me to one of my favorite noise at the piers in the park. Um, what we've noticed, if you walk from Chambers up through Pier 40, is it doesn't, it seems that every single pier now has blasting music on it at some place. So um, if you're <coughs> over by where boats and restaurants are serving or city winery or places, the sound sometimes competitively is kind of overwhelming. And I don't know if there were levels set that they're allowed to be, but if you look at the boat, um, boat that's in the Oysters and Cocktail, Grand Banks, sure, and Quaker. If you look at Grand Banks on 25, and then you're at City Winery on 26, and then you go up, you've got boats on 40. Every, kind of every single place that you're going all along has really, really loud music. So the question that I've been feeling in CB1 is, what are the noise limits? What are the private party boat limits? So in other words, how many nights does each restaurant um, like Grand Banks and City Winery have to be open to the public? Is there a public restroom that is available at City Winery that people use? And I said, no, they have to go to the other one. Um, but you know, there were all kinds of questions that keep coming back to us about that because I've got some people who are walking up, the, up through Hudson River Park saying, it's um, every pier is a nightclub feeling at some point. And, you know, there's, a, there's not as many opportunities for quiet enjoyment of the park. On the other hand, there are other groups of people who think that we should have more Grand Banks parked at every pier. So I'm just trying to find an answer in balance. Um, so there definitely are competing pieces that I, I'm happy to take back um, for our real estate teams to look at um, the ways from City Winery and uh, Grand Banks. I don't know off the top of my head what the limits are for it. Um, to one question, you do have to use a public restroom. Um, City Winery does not have, have one there. Um, you have to use the, the public facility. Um, and the um, uh, both do have a limit on how often they be closed for private events. Um, we do, um, as part of the concession piece, the intent is to be for them to be uh, available for the public. Um, I had prepared for this question at one of our last meetings, and that's been a few months, so I used to be able to say off the top of my head exactly which, how many for each. I think mm -hmm. I, I mentioned it to you once. I was able, I was able to read it over the phone, and I'm happy yeah. to do it for anyone again. Um, but I will say, um, particularly for Grand Banks, um, reservations are, I think, strongly encouraged on their website, and they mean it. Um, so yeah, just not being able to get in doesn't mean it wasn't that, but they do both have limits on how often they can do uh, event-based businesses versus uh, being available for public to public reservation and come in and come in and our Just a, <clears throat> a comment that uh, noise at Pier 26 can affect the safety, the downtown boathouse program. If we can't communicate effectively when we do that by talking, right, then that's how we prevent problems. Uh, as far as City Vineyard, it tends to be when they have their private events at the loudest. And sometimes they're too loud. And we'd like to trust to stop that. This is the second, actually, we mentioned this in June as well. So it's the second time in a row. It's kind of like feedback from the summer. You, know, you, you hear it in the beginning, and then you hear it at the end of the summer. So and I'm happy to take that back. Okay. Um, any other questions about noise? Tom, I see your head is up. Just as an FYI, there are noise limits in the city of New York set by the New York City Department of Environmental Conservation. And there's quick recording and registering of the noise decibel level by the trust and enforcement would be the key to begin to address the issue. 
there already is laws. It's not something you have to make up. Apply for an SLA license, and uh, as we all know, in our community. Well, and no city of New York, you can't yes. have noise above X level uh, in the city. It's you know like mopeds and no exhausts and loud music. It's just not allowed. And it has to be enforced. And here we have an opportunity to enforce it because the trust can do that. All of these people are their leases. Excuse me. Uh, anything else on uh, sound levels in the city? No? Uh, and are the peers city or state? Uh, <clears throat> the peers are that's a real park trust. So I don't think NYPD would come out. And they're all within the city of New York which has sound limitations. In CB4, we are happy to give you the Manhattan cruise ship terminal, um, which as Tammy pointed out, has the Disney cruise uh, theme sound that blows from their cruise ships, as well as very, very loud horns from the many other ships that dock at Piers um, 88 and 90. So just, you know. Yeah, well, the, hor the horns, Jeffrey, are required for navigation. You have to blast three horns when you leave the pier. You just have to. Every ship. Um, I was I was breaking the logistics. <laughs> oh. Doing comparisons. <laughs> okay. Because I didn't get to speak to you. I hope you had a great summer. Likewise. Thank thinking, you. You know, we've we've been reading a lot of different uh, points of view about you know the film studio development. Just by the press has been carried very proactive and positive. Um, and I was wondering if uh, you could tell us CB4's point of view. Happy to. Um, I think he was on the call. Um, so in June of this year, um, Cranes and the New York Times did some coverage of the fact that the city was about to sign a deal with Fornado and new partners, Blackstone and Hudson Pacific, that would relinquish Fornado its, its responsibilities at 92 and only be allowed to redevelop 94, meaning the city now has on its docket and our tax rolls, a derelict peer. Um, they shrunk the scope of the responsibilities at 94 for the Bernardo, uh, for a new project, uh, which Community Board 4 never objected to, The Use, which is um, a film and TV production studio. Um, this is, I described this as kind of um, a co-op studio in that uh, Jeffrey LaFrancois Productions could rent a soundstage alongside Daniel Miller Productions, and we could have that going on. No one production studio owns, uh, it's not going to be an Amazon Studios, you know, only kind of space. Um, we fought sort of tooth and nail to get a significant reduction in parking. Uh, EDC allowed the same number of vehicles to park at just 94 that they were going to allow to park across both piers. Um, not happy about that. At the end of the day, um, we caused a lot of stir back in June. The lease was supposed to immediately be signed. It took several months, but just last week, the lease was finally executed. Um, Fornado is a 49% stakeholder on that lease, and then it split across Hudson Pacific and, and um, Blackstone on the rest. Um, we have EDC, uh, the city coming to CB4's executive committee in, at the end of October to sort of begin the formal process and conversation on what does the construction timeline look like. Um, two big interests of the public are the fact that um, significant improvements are supposed to be made to the bikeway and the pedestrian experience in that area, which right now you mingle with the on-ramp uh, for the cruise ship terminal, um, some loading zones for the cruise ship, a lot of sort of chaotic things um, that were promised to us 14 years ago and were not realized. And now um, they uh, have a four year timeline basically to get this pier built. And while it's not exclusively a part of the lease, they're supposed to accomplish uh, that stuff in that timeline as well. Uh, one of the reasons the city told us that the bikeway improvements could not be a part of the city lease is because it requires state permits to do the construction. And I'll just be blunt that I think that's a bullshit answer, um, but we couldn't get that added to the lease. Yeah, as if city and state don't do things when they want to together. <laughs> Case in point, that's a different part. Um, so um, we are, uh, we, I think I, I'll say plainly, we fought a valiant fight that we did not win all the things we wanted to on. Um, but we now have sort of reestablished the relationship with EDC and Vornado. So I'm, I'm happy to sort of share updates with you guys as they come. Key for us right now is they have technically started construction and they are eager to do that in earnest. Uh, the city is responsible up front for replacing um, the bulk of the pier deck as well as adding additional um, hold so that can hold more weight. 
as well as a lot of the piles. Um, and, you know, just to, uh, I'll eventually stop talking about the bad fact of this, but, you know, the biggest issue for this lease is that um, it's a 99 year lease that is not tied to inflation. Um, it has a very minimal escalation every five years. And so in 99 years, they will only be paying $2.8 million of today's money. Whereas the Manhattan cruise ship terminal, which has a 49 year lease, is actually tied to inflation. And so even though we were able to point to um, the very smart leases in Hudson River Park, Chelsea Piers, the Intrepid, uh, 57, where we are, um, the city was refused to relinquish and even acknowledge that their own leases are tied to inflation. Um, so. And what happens to 92? Uh, Good question. Um, EDC has said they need some time to think internally about what they wanna do there. Uh, technically, um, they could put an RFP out for whatever they think is, is the correct thing to do there. Uh, Board 4 did say that 92 and 94 should be handed over to Hudson River Park. Uh, we believe Hudson River Park does a much better job of redeveloping piers for both public and commercial use, um, but they didn't want to hear that. Um, maybe we'll win that on 92. I'll be honest, for folks that are not sort of familiar with the area, it's a very, it feels a very heavy commercial sort of footprint area of the park. And so um, we don't know what's going to come for 92, um, whether or not the city has interest in expanding the cruise ship terminal uh, formally to allow additional cruise ships to dock there um, or what that will be. But um, they asked for six months before they re-engage on a conversation on that. So, you know, I'll start my clock um, is what it comes down to. Well, terrific. Anybody have any questions about uh, what Jeffrey was uh... Any update on, on the 92 and 94 from studio? Are there any giveaways in terms of bulk and things that resulted in public benefit? I should have said that the uh, north side of 92, 94 and the western edge will have an esplanade. Hudson River Park is also getting 1,800 square feet of sort of back of house space. Um, we purposely uh, didn't think it was actually smart to put a classroom there, it might not be used. So give the park some smart backup house space. Also gonna be bathrooms for the first mm -hmm. time, which we're very excited about. So yes, there is some public benefit, um, but Tammy, the Esplanade doesn't even go all the way around the pier. It stops at the end. So you can't even get back. You can't even make a loop. Um, and the public benefits they've delivered are what they promised in 2009 and never implemented. So they're you know 14 years too late. But like Jeffrey said, we'll see if it happens. I'll be happy if we get a set of decent public restrooms that are acceptable for the mm -hmm. public. Agreed. There and the trust definitely needs maintenance space distributed throughout the park. The, the, the Clinton Cove will have public restrooms at Pier 97 open later this year. Does that mean you're getting rid of the outhouse in Clinton Cove? Or we don't know. The porta potty, yes. Once we have real restrooms a uh, short walk away, we will not have the porta potty as well. <laughs> it won't feel like Clinton Cove anymore without the smell of a porta potty. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, have to change the name. We're resuming the uh, Pier 76 task force. I think it's uh, on Thursday, right? Uh, yep. You know, right? Um, uh, so this was a big task force, um, which we mentioned uh, at our last meeting kicked off. We had its first, one of the first two meetings, um, which was, uh, I think, largely kind of going over some historic information for the group. Um, we are having another meeting uh, this week, and we're continuing the work with the group over the fall uh, to really look at um, uh, Pier 76 to, uh, and options for uh, redevelopment. Um, as folks, uh, we've said before, and folks keep in mind, um, you know, Pier 76, we, we inherited it in very rough shape, as we have in uh, some other piers. Um, they're all wooden piles. They are, we are going to have to have a, we have a, a significant monitoring program. Um, there are areas already of the pier that are off limit because of, uh, they are unsafe for access. Um, that will continue to grow over time. Um, we do make some modest revenue off of events and things on there now, short-term rentals, what have you. Um, but at some point, as as the marine borers continue to deteriorate the wooden piles, um, we will see increasingly either in incredibly expensive uh, investment to maintain, merely maintain the existing load, which is, um, or 
uh, we will, uh, or a slow reduction of uh, pure space or somewhere in between. There is, it's not a, a hard and fast in any one of those. Um, so we want to work with the community to really uh, to figure out community elected officials uh, to, to really identify uh, possible solutions for redevelopment that both um, create the generate revenue that the trust needs on an ongoing basis for operations, um, as well as uh, offer ways in which to fund the total redevelopment of the pier. When we last had this conversation in 2020, um, you know, there was not a use at that point that penciled out that could both fund the entire reconstruction of um, the pier, as well as the ongoing revenue pieces. Um, it, it, it There was a Delta then that used its office. Nobody at this point believed. <laughs> An obvious and substantial use. Um, so we're going to try to work through uh, what other alternatives for uh, may work. Great, um, Tom. Muted. You're muted, um, Tom. Um, you. You're muted, Tom. Okay. I'm sorry. Am I am I back online? Yeah. Um, the could the trust please provide the advisory council with notices of all the meetings regarding this incredibly important piece of the park and please send us the minutes and results of each of the meetings so that we can be kept up to speed as it moves along and those of us who may or may not be interested could participate there's a select, uh, there's a lot of people that participate in the task force. There are two members of the advisory council, myself and Isaac Daniel, the members from the different community boards. Uh, it's a big group. So Yes, I just asked if the advisory council be, can, can be kept informed of the meetings. We are. And if we can receive yep. the results of each of the meetings so that all of us you know if are as meetings informed. Like I don't know if that's an, I don't it does it's a it's a process of uh, I don't know Robert why don't you talk about the goals and the mission yeah so um it it is it, it, it does not have um um structure that you were talking about it um it is uh sort of on a discussion basis with um a group of uh. Uh, community members. Uh, so each of the community boards has representatives on it. Uh, the advisory council has representatives or elected officials have represented on it. Hudson River Park Trust, uh, Trust staff, um, uh, Hudson River Park Trust board, as well as um, uh, a representative from uh, Hudson River Park Friends. Um, it is not. It's uh, you know. It is not in any way a decision making body. It is for discussion purposes uh, to really try to work through some of the the thorny and sticky issues um, that arise with these pieces. Um, so there aren't there aren't minutes. It's it's not what we're doing. We're we're working our way through both sort of an education piece, some analysis, and then some discussion points um, to try to identify um, possible paths. Uh, forward, um, all of which would then have their own uh, specific approval processes and all of those sorts of things um, to come up with what folks, what is uh, folks think can work here and some collective understanding about that. Logical first step, and I agree with it wholeheartedly. I'm just asking that as information is available, those of us who have invested a tremendous amount of time and energy in the trust and the advisory council be given briefings occasionally so that we're all aware of what's happening. That's all. And people might like input and might see things that haven't been considered or uh, so, so it would be good to have that public interchange, if you will. Right in uh, this month's Hudson River Park uh, Advisory Council report. Uh, okay. Um, is there, I was gonna move on to new business. We've kind of covered everything on the agenda. Uh, Coming uh, meeting would be, please just mark it and pencil in your calendar. It would be October 10th. It's going to be a 6 p.m. meeting, and it might be actually virtual only, not actually in person. Um, and that is October 10th, 6 p.m. But we'll send a reminder. Um, some of the discussion points that we spoke at the executive committee level was uh, wanting to discuss the heliport legislation. Um, and we also wanted to dive more into the Greenway reclassification. And Tracy, maybe it'd be a, a good time also to invite some of the e-bike cycling folks to uh, maybe help us uh, make our voice louder about um, not sharing, you know, uh, human powered cycles with uh, high powered e-bikes. 
Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll introduce you and we can talk about it you know, later this week. Thank you. Thank you. Didn't we put transportation alternatives on the advisory council? Transportation alternatives is on the advisory council. Anna wasn't able to make it today because she moved back to Spain, but we will be oh. a new uh, transportation alternatives representative at the next meeting. I'd like to ask if at the next meeting we can, um, the trust can explain to us the follow up on Pier 98. Because when we were talking through the permit process, they mentioned things like installing um, independent temperature monitors and having the technical advisory committee advise, uh, involved in the monitoring system and um, using this for education, which I think is great. So I'm wondering if you could just give us a briefing next up meeting on how that's being treated. Sure, I can, I can actually talk about the temperature uh, sensors piece uh, right now. Um, so uh, this summer we have been piloting um, at, I believe it's two locations in the park where we already have monitoring uh, going on um, at temperature sensors to see if we can have uh, the right equipment um, to, uh, to both collect the data and see if it works. Um, uh, I think we also have ones at varying depths um, to see if there are um, differences across them um, as part of a, a, a sort of a preliminary uh, uh, exploration of it that we'll then have a conversation with our with the TAC um, about uh, after after we get the results and we see what they are as to whether or not uh, it is something that uh, they, they think is worth uh, further exploration. Great. And the, and the request to move towards uh, less consumptive technologies in terms of water and uh, pollution is something that's a long-term um, working with Con Edison, right? Ed um, has, um, and I, I, I actually shared this, I believe uh, earlier this year, it may, it may have been over the summer, um, I'm happy for folks to resurface it if, if folks need it. Um, and I know Community Board 4 and others have gotten it directly, as the Advisory Council got it directly as well. Um, uh, Con Ed has been going through its permit renewal process, and we shared information from um, Con Ed about it, as well as from, uh, as part of their DEC uh, public engagement pieces of it. I think, um, I think just this past week, uh, there was another one notice about- um, Air. Yes. For its DECs, the permit rule pieces for their uh, permits on uh, for their 59th Street power plant. Um, and so yeah, I, I think we have shared those. Uh, we shared uh, certainly the one uh, about uh, the uh, from the pier on the permits for their water uses from DEC. Oh, yeah, I participated. That's that's given. Um, I, I'm not questioning that at all. Thank you. Topic and a plug for the pier that we're in, um, sort of Hudson River Park adjacent, but there we're in the Discovery Tank, which is Hudson River Park room. There's three other classrooms in this pier that if you run a nonprofit or are on nonprofit boards, um, you have free access to book this space. And they're wonderful spaces. Uh, frankly, um, I'd love to see these classrooms used more, not the Discovery Tank, but the other uh, rooms and it's available. It's a very easy booking process. Um, maybe we can circulate that to the AC in the lead up to our October meeting for what, are the, what how do you how do you go about booking it what do you have to how do you have to represent yourself to sure it, it, the credentials are pretty um, straightforward and simple Jamestown manages that uh, process um, they uh, basically I think you have to prove your nonprofit or sort of the community interest group that you are or have um, see if the space is available share your sort of tech specs and the space is yours. Um, I can tell you, um, I've been a part of getting many, many um, nonprofit groups to have meetings here. Um, and and the, the room converts from three to one big room too. So um, spread the words amongst your, not just your, but internal, but external nonprofit friends um, to have a meeting here. If, if folks know them, the, these spaces, these class, public, publicly bookable classroom spaces are, are required in the Hudson River Park Trust lease. Um, and uh, with this, um, we're actually, it, we think that they are being a growing success. Yes. Like said, they certainly could be booked more. There are available hours. Um, we have community group CCBA, I'm told, has all but moved in on uh, part of their monthly meetings. Um, that's Chelsea Coalition of Block Associations. Um, there have been uh, citywide nonprofits that have gone to education classes here. Uh, there have been voting safety classes here. Um, there have been any world of uh, uh, nonprofit lectures.
lectures and symposiums as part of it um, from across from across the city. So um, is there something we're really excited about? Um, I'm certainly happy to share the information how folks can book them. Yes. Can you just send me a flyer so I can send it? I mean, I'm happy to forward it to AFP, which is the Association of Fundraising Professionals in New York. Oh, sure. And that might be the fastest way to get that up. Or the youth leagues. Or the youth leagues. The British Little League is here today. Yeah. Aren't you tired of having your meetings at the DAF? I mean, you could have them here. <laughs> uh, anyone else? you have anything else to say, Tammy? Are we good? I'm good. Is the safety committee reporting today? We did talk about safety. Uh, we talked about the break-ins. We talked about the food right. bikes. Uh, right. We so talked just, about the assaults. Yeah, uh, yeah, I've got all that. Um, did yeah, the, <clears throat> the committee yeah. has not actually met. And... That's why I came up at, at the executive committee. I said, I haven't had time because I'm dealing with too many emotionally disturbed people. <laughs> but and I apologize for being late, but we're excitedly interviewing for a district manager today. So wow. some of my time back. Mm -hmm. um, did we have anything from the diversity, equity, and inclusion yeah. committee? Not met. I think the only thing that you met you missed early was oh, the yeah. yeah, with the, uh, the resolution passed uh, with the one abstention, which was Richard Corman. And I did uh, the two minutes, April and and the June. minutes passed, April minutes passed, I did the June. Oh, okay. So like we can publish those now on the site. I know that there was uh, a request to make sure that all of our minutes are on the website, and the trust has been taking care of it, and now we can add two more uh, months of meetings. Uh, uh, so you said it was one abstent? Well, like Richard Corbin, I can send that to you later, but you. I know- oh, uh, and Andrew. I thought Andrew abstained. Richard no, a Andrew had something on, on the chat, I think. He said okay. something he was saying on the chat. Did he? I think Did so. The I didn't see it. I, I happened to Did see it. Did he abstain? Uh, yeah, I abstained on the uh, first resolution. Okay. All right. So we have two. Thank you. Okay. okay. So, uh, we have a motion to adjourn the meeting. Round two. One. We have a second. Okay. Meeting's adjourned. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you uh, hmm? next so month. The uh, like day after, yeah. on the day, Tuesday, October 10th. Great. Thank you all. Thanks. Yeah, I've had it. So, I think we're going to just take virtual from there, okay? Yeah, um, it's, not me, it's not me for a little bit. Yeah. I'm coming back, so I'm not going to scold everybody. I'm not. Yeah. yeah.